This is a podcast where I'm going to kind of help Kessler drive and I'm going to dish him out some questions and try to, we'll try to get some insights from him from a, from a kid's perspective to see how he sees the Formula One world. So uh, let's get started. Are you ready, Kessler? Let's do it. I'm fired up. Welcome to the Formula One for Kids podcast. I'm your host, Kessler Sove, and here with me is my dad. Hello. And today, we just finished watching the Montreal Grand Prix, so we're doing a recap. So Kessler, this is your home race, Canadian Grand Prix. Not only that, but this is your first episode of your first podcast ever. How does it feel? It feels pretty good. Yeah? Nervous a bit? Yeah. Yeah, but excited at the same time? Yeah. Is it fun that you get to talk to F1 with this whole new um, audience of people through podcast? Yeah, it's really nice. And how did how did you get into F1? Um, my dad showed me Drive to Survive, which got hooked and started watching the Grand Prix with him. And then, yeah, we decided to make this podcast. That's one cool dad you've got. What is it about F1 that makes it so interesting and appealing to you? It's like the strategy plus like, it's more like the strategy of like what kind of racers to pick and like like the strategy of the tires and like how long the pit stops will take. That's what I find interesting. Yeah. And a bit of the overtakes and I'd, the crashes. <laughs> I'd, I'd ask you who your favorite driver is. And those of us, those those of you out there listening today, won't be able to see him, but he's wearing a Max Verstappen Red Bull racing hat. So, who's who's your is that your favorite driver? Yeah. And why is Max your favorite driver? He's really good. He seems to never get in trouble with the car, right? He seems to go through wet races or poor tire conditions and just make the car work for him. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes he crashes. Like, he didn't qualify on Baku, but he doesn't do that that much. But then once he doesn't qualify, what does he do when it comes to the actual race? He does do really well in the actual race. Yeah, he catches back up. What, he gets a second on that one? Was... He got second. Yeah, that's pretty good, eh? Okay, well, today we're here to talk about, this is a, a, a Montreal Grand Prix or Canadian Grand Prix recap. So... What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about kind of some of the three key highlights maybe that uh, we saw during the race. Yeah. And then uh, we'll just go from there. But before we start, um, you know, I don't know how many of you out there have been watching uh, this year, but it just seems like almost every race, Logan Sargent seems to get a DNF, which is a do, did not finish. And uh, so we're going to start with a, a segment called Not Again, Logan. And I'll let uh, Kessler take over for that one. So go ahead, Kessler. Not again, Logan. There you go. All right. That concludes our not again, Logan segment. So you had three friends over today to watch the Formula One with you? Yeah. Oh, you guys are getting pretty riled up down in the basement. I remember hearing you guys cheering for a particular driver. Oh, yeah. We wanted Alcon to get past the William. Is that Albon? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? You're a fan because one of your buddies is an Alpine fan? Yeah. And you got you guys all to back his, his favorite horse there? Yeah. Gasly was further back. We didn't really think he could make it that far. So. And why Alcon, was Gasly, why was Gasly so far back? Do you remember from qualifying what happened? I don't. Somebody got in his way. Oh, yeah. And got a penalty. Science got in his way to get him into 17th, but Science got a penal, leaving him farther back than his teammates so that kind of leads into one of the you know one of our three main things from this um from this grand prix which is you know carlos Sainz is a driver for ferrari and ferrari this week was kind of surprising in a way could you tell me how ferrari was surprising this this week i think they did something today that was different they didn't do a sergeant they did is that what we're gonna call it now a dnf is now known as a sergeant yeah i think so <laughs> and they did have a really good strategy for one pit one pit stop i which noticed is how I noticed. they pulled ahead of alcon and the william 
Yeah, I noticed that some teams had a two pit strategy and some of them had a one. And I think the ones that had the one pit strategy seemed to really benefit. Some of them actually had a three pit strategy. Do you think that was on purpose though? Or do you think that was just kind of like a result of circumstances while racing? Yeah, result of circumstances, I think. Not really planned, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like take example Perez, final two laps, puts on the softs to get the fastest lap for an extra point. He is in the top 10, so it does count. If you're not in the top 10, then you go get the point for fastest lap, which is interesting I found in the rule book. Yeah, that's good. Do you find anything else interesting in the rule book? Well, that in qualifying, if it's considered wet, then you can use any kind of tires you want for all of the qualifying. So let's say qualifying Q1 is classified wet, like there's a lot of rain. You can use any tires you want. You're probably gonna use like an inter wet then, but then let's say- What's an inter wet? An inter is like an intermediate tire. It's like used for like light rain, not that heavy. Then wet is like for like pretty heavy rain. Heavy rain, really heavy rain. Boating. Yeah. <laughs> it can, the amount of water that it pushes out of the way, wet tires, mm -hmm. is equivalent, I mean per second, is equivalent to a bathtub of water. Yes, at full speed, I remember that. At over 300 kilometers an hour on those stretches, the water that those tires displace behind them every second is equivalent to a bathtub. Isn't that, isn't that wild? Yeah. That's one of the wildest wild. things I've ever heard. A bathtub full of water every second. Imagine being able to fill your bathtub in one second. Yeah, imagine softs or hards just trying to do that. You would just skid on the track, right? Yeah, you just skid and crash. So can you imagine? You can't even turn. Can you imagine just following a F1 car when it's wet at 300 kilometers an hour behind with a bathtub trying to fill your bathtub with water? Oh, that'd be easy. <laughs> that'd be very easy. It'd take about four seconds if you hid behind one of the wheels. Oh, what about chasing an F1 car with a bathtub? Would that part be easy? No, no. I thought we got to sit in the bathtub with a road attached to the car. <laughs> oh, that's good. And then you know what? I think in a future episode, we'll talk about the different compounds because there are, what, like we talked, we talked about intermediate tires, which use in light rain and then wet, which are used when it's really raining outside. There's also soft, medium and hard, and we can go into all that, but we're going to save that for future episodes. I think one of the biggest biggest things of this Grand Prix was just Alexander Albon's defending. Yeah. Like he had four cars within, you know, half a second of each other behind him. He was leading the DRS train. So for those of you who are not familiar with DRS, DRS is uh, an abbreviation for a drag reduction system. Is that right? That yeah, that's right? drag. Now, Kester, could you tell me what the purpose of the DRS is on the rear tail? So it opens up and then air flows through, creating less drag and helping the cars go faster on the straights, creating some epic battles. Oh, epic battles. Yes, I love that. Well, what do you think about Albon defending? It's pretty impressive. Yeah, the, uh, the defending was pretty good by his part, um, especially because Williams is not really the best car yeah, for well, defending. Do you remember hearing how excited Albon was to get P7? Oh yeah. So why do you think you'd be so excited to get P7? Why is it? Usually when you watch a race, you think, oh yeah, if you don't get first or second or maybe even third, it doesn't really matter. So why would, why would someone like him and his team be so excited to, to get seventh place? Well, in the grand scheme of racing, you need points, right? And Williams is one of the farther back teams, we assume, which I think... They're like one of the last places in the standings right now. So they don't get too many points. Yeah. So that was a big like gain in points. Six points to help them gain on the other teams and maybe pass them. And one gain in a position, a team position, can gain a lot of money. So you're saying there's some kind of correlation between where you end up in the standings and the money you the the money you can win at the end of the season. Yeah. You know what I found really interesting that I'd like to get your take on today's race is is what happened to George Russell. So first of all, let's go over what you know what what happened to George Russell. So Russell clipped the barrier and it 
he was like talking like sorry i messed it up and then he thought he was a goner he thought, thought it was, he was a goner. Over, right yeah but then he came to pit he, they told him to come into pits and they could fix his car which was really surprising for me they did it pretty quick too didn't they yeah they did like 10 seconds that's that's impressive yeah they fixed his car then he was went out on track he and was last place but he made his way all the way up to eighth but then he got an engine problem i'm thinking from the clip on the wall yeah but that was pretty impressive he was in the points again from yeah. last place just imagine had he kept going where he could have landed you know so who did you think was going to win the race and podium well that's you know it's almost a foregone conclusion now that max verstappen is usually everyone's pick at winning because the red bull car is so much faster not only that he is an excellent driver you know people a lot of people say it's the car but He's actually a really good driver if you watch him. He's always got really good control of the car. So it usually comes down to who's going to be second place. And I think it was a pretty good battle for a while between Lewis Hamilton, who ended up in third, and Fernando Alonso, who ended up in second place. But um, sometimes you're thinking, you wonder if, you know, something happens to Max's car, then that opens everything up for Alonso winning. And I think there's a lot of Alan Alonso fans this year and who'd like to see yeah, him win. Yeah, my dad's an Alonso fan. I am an Alonso fan, and, and you know want to know I why? Am. Why? I don't know if you stuck around to watch the um, the trophy, the ceremony. Yeah, yeah, I did. So they were handed their trophies for first, second, and third, and then they got their champagne and they sprayed each other. And Alonso did something I've never seen before. I mean, I've been watching Formula One for very long, but he went over the edge and dropped his bottle of champagne to his to his mechanics team, who then went on to celebrate. I thought it was really cool that. He did something that was very team spirited like that and so what was your favorite part of the the grand prix today did you have a favorite part i think my favorite part was when george russell passed the two battlers who ended up going in which i think was Tsunoda and kevin magnuson like they couldn't turn because of being like so battled I think they kind of clipped each other and went into like an extra straight, mm -hmm. which they were fine and they could kept they could keep going. But I think Kevin gained a place there yeah. in the battle. I'm not sure, but I think he did. Anything else you found interesting about today's race? I found that the DRS trains. There was a lot of them. But some of them weren't included. Like, there was a DRS train that was, like, all half a second from each other from, like, 10th to 17th or something crazy. Yeah. And, like, not a lot of passing. And they didn't mention it. They only mentioned, like, the first three. So I guess when there's a DRS train, meaning that, you know, you have the person in front and then the second, third, fourth, fifth person behind them all have DRS, it's really hard for them to, to pass each other, right? Yeah. And I've, if you can't get past the first person in the train, then you're kind of stuck like that for a while. And that's why everyone was kind of praising Albon's defending today, right? Because he couldn't let anyone behind him pass, which is Akon, if I remember. Right? Yeah. Akon, the Norris, was also close behind the DRS train. Yeah. He was like half in the DRS train, half not. And that's interesting. Speaking about Akon and Norris, there was an interesting thing that happened between them near the end of the race, if you remember. Was there something about Akon's car? Yeah, Akon's um, real like rear tail, like was like wobbling a lot. So when he went to a when he went into a turn, it was just like wobbling a lot. And then when he went on the straights, I noticed when he has his DRS, it stopped wobbling that much. It was just wobbling like a little. But then once he got his DRS closed, it just started wobbling a lot again. And Norris told that, like, said that, and we're still waiting to hear what happens, but it might be a penalty for Alcon. You think it could be a penalty? Is I don't think like it's going to be a penalty. Car? Yeah, I don't think it'd be a penalty, too. It might. It might be like a one or two place. What was, so what was Norris concerned about? What was his concern with the wing? That it was going to snap off, like it was going to wiggle, wiggle, snap, not wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And what are the consequences if that happens? Getting like hit and having to get a new like front wing, probably. Or even worse, have... the DNF, like he could have, the wing could have hit him and just kind of went sailing over the car. What if it went under the car? I mean, he could have gotten airtime. I mean, if the wing hit properly oh, under yeah. that front wing of Norris, 
then he could have, you know, got some air. Oh. Uh, Dukes of Hazard style. I think he probably would have crashed if that happened. Because they were, like, on a windy part of the circuit. So, like, the windiest part, probably. Well, things worked out. It didn't come off. Nobody got hurt. Yeah. No crashes. Just something we can laugh about now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lance passed Bottas in, like, the... By, like... Three thousandths of a second. Oh, right at the finish line Yeah, right at the finish line. It was just amazing to see him right at the end. Which gives Aston Martin, I think, more points than Mercedes in that race. So, they're catching up. Yeah, that's good. And how do you you feel about Mercedes Um, as a team, this race? They did pretty good. We already talked about George. Could have done a bit better. How about Lewis? Lewis. What does Lewis's outcome sh- show about the team? Lewis was pretty solid, battling with Alonso for a bit, but then Alonso finally able to get some time on him and stopping that. But he did have a chance. Yeah. No, it was close. I think Alonso was being kind of held back a bit from going, from pushing all the way, but yeah, it was pretty close between Lewis and Fernando, eh? All right, so if you enjoyed this and you're ready for the next recap. We'll be back at the end of the month for the Austrian Grand Prix. We'll also try to do a few chit-chats on this podcast. Between then, see ya.